Okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for the Magnet webinar today. As you know, there's a reason that we're doing this remotely now um, with all of the COVID-19 event cancellations. We at Magnet are working very, very hard to make sure that there's no vacuum in valuable content. So we've ramped up the frequency of our webinars um, and we're bringing on experts to talk about um, everything related to COVID-19 and the startup space and how we can survive, thrive, find opportunities. Um, and so today we've got Basel Muftah with us from Global Ventures. Hi, Basel. Hi, Noor. How are you? Good. Alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I hope you're, I hope you're safe. You look like you're at home, so that's good. Yes, and you're outdoors, which seems very nice. So yeah, we hope everybody is uh, getting us from home and nobody's out and about. Um, and we've got quite a lot to, uh, to cover today, so uh, we can just get started. Okay, so we're here to talk about, sure. um, we're here to talk about how Egyptian startups can scale right now. But before we do that, let's talk about what scaling means for Egyptian startups. Sure. So I guess there's a lot of meanings for scaling. But anyway, before I, I get started, I just want to say I hope everybody's safe and sound. And, you know, I think ho hopefully people are following the instructions of, of professionals around the world about staying, you know, staying at home. Uh, where I'm happy to be here in Dubai at home in, 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 on, on a lovely day and a lovely weather. But nonetheless, just to get to your question around scaling. So, you know, the bottom line is this, right? There's a lot of meanings for scaling. One, it's about which geographical places do you go to and sort of expand or repeat your business model. Scaling also talks about how do you improve your unit economics and how do you improve the way you run your business so that you can um, effectively you know, do more with less, if you like. Those are, those are definition, two definitions of scaling. I think when it comes to Egyptian startups, they'll always have a choice, right, on the geographical angle. One choice is in relation to do you go towards Africa or do you go towards GCC? I've seen a lot of startups coming from Egypt going into the GCC. And we have these, especially in sort of these big funded sectors like trucking, you have Trella and Trucker coming at each other from, you know, one from Egypt, one from UAE meeting in Saudi Arabia. You have a little bit of, uh, uh, of you know, um, other companies and other industries, if you like, sort of uh, moving at each other in different ways across the GCC. But I do think Africa is really interesting. And I do think, and I've seen a few Egyptian startups starting to look at Africa. I wish a lot more of them would. I think the opportunity there is tremendous. You know, lately we've been studying Nigeria and Kenya quite a bit and, and, and looking at that. So I see a lot of potential. The other type of scaling, and I just want to mention that briefly because it, it, it's in today's world, especially with everything that's going on, it's terribly important, which is can your business scale with less resources? We know that you know the, the, the COVID-19 coronavirus epidemic is gonna lead to less cash. We know it's going to lead to more constraint times, maybe even lower economic growth on a, on a GDP level. And startups will be challenged around, can you keep growing without burning so much money? Can you keep growing and, and your unit economics really scale with you? Um, I think there's wonderful opportunities that, 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 that are going to come out of what's happening right now. But in the immediate future, scaling also means how do you expand with less money? Okay. Um, so we, just to dive into the Egyptian ecosystem a little bit, um, we released our 2019 Egypt Venture Investment Report at Magnet, um, which included pre-money valuations for the first time. And obviously the data on 2019 is probably going to look very, very different from the data <coughs> of 2020, right? Um, and for the first time ever in 2019, Egypt ranked first in terms of number of deals, taking home about 25%. And ranked second in terms of amount of funding raised at 95 million, um, mm -hmm. narrowly overtaking Saudi Arabia because of the swivel investment. So for a country with 100 million people, um, where 95% of the deals are happening at the earlier stages, are these healthy metrics, do you think, Bessel? Are they good indicators? Um, yes and no. I think the first metric is, is, is a good one. I mean, the number of deals year on year has definitely improved. And Egypt, remember, is a third of the Arab population of the MENA region, if you want. It's a sizable economy, especially when you take out oil industry. 
from the GCC comparably it's a quite a large economy, lots of consumerism, etc. So, and, and there are lots of entrepreneurs. Definitely Egypt should be getting the lion's share of the number of deals. There should be numerous entrepreneurs and, and hopefully getting funded and so on. I do think that Egypt is behind. And what I mean by that is the ecosystem was, you know, slowed down by the 2011 revolution. It took a little while for that, you know, all of that to sort of settle out. And then eventually the incubators, accelerators, government, you know, support and, and industry support and corporate support. And eventually we started to see uh, companies coming out. So I actually predict that the number of companies and entrepreneurs in Egypt will continue to rise. And, and I think it will be, you know, will become one of, one of the largest in terms of the ecosystem size. Yeah. The funding one is disappointing. Disappointing because Egypt continues to receive less than its fair share, I guess. But to be fair, it also has to do with the quality size of those of those companies, right? You have to remember that when, you know, for every transaction you do in Egypt, when you look at it from a dollar perspective, it's a lot weaker than if you look, you know, at a deal, for example, in the UAE or, or Saudi. Now, yes, sure, Saudi UAE is more expensive to run and therefore, you know, it, it sort of equates itself. But when people are looking at revenue growth and looking at it from a dollar perspective, Egypt will always be uh, a little bit unfavorable in the sense of the, you know, the, the, can, you know, the, the strength of the Egyptian pound and so on. Yeah. That I being can... said, I think things will scale and I think things will have a chance to grow and, and eclipse but there's not a lot of late stage investing happening in Egypt uh, or as much as there should be, frankly. Yeah, because uh, you can do a lot more with a million dollars in Egypt than you can do with a million dollars in the UAE as a function of the currency. But we also saw in 2019 that two thirds of the investors in Egyptian startups came from outside of Egypt. Um, from an outside perspective, that number seems quite high. What do you think of that? I think it's great. Egypt's an attractive country. It always has been, right? Let's not forget that. Um, I'm Egyptian, as, as I think most people know, in the ecosystem and, and, and grew up there and recognize that Egypt has always been a powerful country when it comes to entrepreneurship, innovation, and so on. There's lots of great startups going back to Internet 1.0 and, you know, and, and all the way until today. So more than 20 years of, of that. Um, so I guess the short answer is I'm glad to see foreign investment coming in. I think people are attracted to Egypt. I do think I still have the question around, you know, how do you get scale in Egypt? Yes, the dollar goes further in terms of cost, but at the same time, the revenue from a dollar perspective is, is smaller. Therefore, the size of the enterprise could, could end up being smaller. Now, over time, if things scale well, there'll be some very, very powerful Egyptian startups for sure. Okay. So now let's talk about um, a couple of industries that have become increasingly important um, in the Egyptian ecosystem um, as of late. So initially transport, right? So you mentioned that um, there's a lot that's interesting that's happening in the transport sector in Egypt. Um, we're seeing companies securing larger amounts of funding, whether you're looking at Swivel or you're looking at Hailan or you're looking at Trilla, Egyptian transport companies um, that have raised you know, um, not insignificant rounds. So with COVID-19 and social distancing and all of us working from home, what does this mean for these guys um, and for their trajectory, but also for transport tech moving forward and how can they survive? So I think transportation, mobility, if you want at large, has always been a very attractive sector because the infrastructure in the region, the availability of options, and the, the sort of public transport options are very limited, if you like. So yes. definitely, as you know, anybody looking at mobility finds that very interesting, whether it's the Kareem and Ubers of this world, you know, with personal transportation. I think we've seen people try to go sort of down the, the, the bike, you know, the, 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 what do you call them? The bikes or the mopeds like or whatever micro, it is that yeah. side. You've had Highland. Yeah, micro transportation. And then you've had Highland with the tricycles and the sort of Gojek model. And then you have um, obviously Trella and, and, and Trucker, you know, looking at the sort of long distance trucking transportation. And I think there's others that are looking at shipping and integrated uh, logistics and all of that stuff. So the short answer is the industry is very attractive. It makes sense to see companies out of Egypt, but let's also remember there are companies in Saudi and in UAE coming into Egypt. So 
Egypt will be a hotly contested mobility sector. And it's not going to be simple. I mean, what I mean by that is you need to get, sorry for the language, we need to get down and dirty into the work, you know, get to know the community. And if you're an, an entrepreneur coming from outside into Egypt, you better find out um, how Egypt really works and understand how the transport industry works, which is not simple and, and definitely full of, of a lot of, uh, of insight and know-how. And vice versa, if you're an Egyptian startup looking to scale into Saudi or GCC or into Africa, you better well, you know, figure out how you're going to scale the business outside of Egypt because what works in Egypt does work in those places as well as money. You know, the cost ration in Egypt, as we said earlier, is, is, is less expensive, but you better know how you're going to, you know, change your model or, or pivot your, your product to be able to work in those markets. So I think the short answer to your question is, I think for mobility, Egypt's a very attractive market. For trucking in particular, Egypt, Saudi, UAE is a very interesting corridor. Also, Africa is an interesting corridor. I'm dying to see how this is going to work out between some of these bigger players that have been funded or well-funded recently. But I think it's a long journey, and I think there's still some ups and downs uh, to go. Right. Um, and then there's another one that has maybe not suffered so much that might find its golden opportunity now. So we look at fintech, right? And fintech has been an exciting um, industry and vertical for the last couple of years across the MENA region and all over the world. Um, it leads in terms of number of deals. Um, and it actually saw the, the region's, one of the region's first IPOs um, in Egypt and Saudi. Um, but yeah. is COVID-19 now, with more of us being at home and having now to transact online, so can we expect to see this kind of like wide scale digital adoption um, of fintech solutions in Egypt, which has been um, quite difficult to bank as a population of 100 million people? Is now the moment for fintech in Egypt? So it's a, actually the news over the last week is it's, could change your perspective on that or could give you multiple perspectives. So the, the short answer is, is probably yes. And it does make sense the, the, on the on the fintech side and be, business to consumer B two C models. There's always been a huge attraction. Egypt again being a large population, hugely attractive for B two C fintechs. However, however, you're about to see government stepping into this, right? And and I think you know just just over the last 24, 48 hours, the Egyptian government made an announcement as part of its new stimulus package to include regulation changes for digital wallets. Hmm. What does that really mean? Is that an opportunity? Is that a threat? You know, and, and, and governments competing sort of with, with, with fintechs will always be a challenge. Ideally, they partner. Ideally, they work together. And, and you know the rest of the story. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is we're moving through rapid times. I think that it's great to see a lot of, you know, of, of fintech, if you want, or financial technology businesses erupting or coming up in, in, the, in the Middle East. I think many people just... We're expecting crazy valuations, except expecting crazy, you know, amounts of funding and think it's a, a, a walk in the park. I think the last few weeks, last few days have shown it's not that simple. It's ever changing environment. Governments will change regulations. Banks will start to compete more directly with them. There will be, a, a, you know, it will take a very agile team to get through this. Okay. Um, and so ultimately your outlook for fintech startups right now. Would you start a fintech startup in Egypt right now? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, sorry, I think I, I shouldn't say that. I should say, <laughs> I think now is as good a time as ever to, 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 to do a startup, meaning some of the best startups in the world have started during crises yes. and definitely startups. Um, there's no perfect time if you like it. And, and it's a long journey. So. It's, it's not for me to judge whether now is the right time to, to do a startup or not. I think it comes down to the entrepreneur. It comes down to the idea. It comes down to how they're going to fund it and be able to build it. I've seen single person, you know, uh, fintechs started recently become really something powerful in, in Egypt, right? And, and without, I'm, in this one, I can't mention its name, but nonetheless, it's, you know, it's, it was one guy and two part-timers built a fantastic thing, got a lot of attention and already got sold to another fintech, if you like, um, and, and merged with them into what's going to become an even more powerful one. And I guess what I'm trying to say to you is th there's never a perfect time and a perfect moment. I think the quality of the team 
and the quality of the idea and the uniqueness of it is important. If yeah. you're coming with an idea of a digital wallet or another payment gateway, please, please spare us. Um, you know, not to say that there, some of these won't be successful. I'm just saying there's a lot out there. So you better, you know, quickly come to the point about what makes you differentiated or unique. That being said, there are still lots of problems in Egypt and around the region in terms of financial inclusion, in terms of access to online payments and so on that I do think startups could address with unique solutions. And we're always interested in, 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 in new ideas and good ideas, uh, you know, especially from people with experience in the industry. Absolutely. Um, and another industry that's been having um, an, I mean, a, an expected surge is the area of health tech and especially telemedicine, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is this surge a good thing for these companies in the long run? Is it sustainable? Can we expect it to last longer than, I mean, the next few quarters? So this crisis is not one of those crises that is um, um, going to go away anytime soon. Let's just understand that, right? Even if the idea of the coronavirus or the virus itself is addressed by the health, you know, by the healthcare industry, by global, you know, WHO and global players and pharmaceuticals, the fact that everybody and literally, you know, most of the world is now working from home and the fact that people are having to learn how to conduct their business and way of life for that matter over internet and connection and so on is, a, is in my opinion, a, a permanent change or is the new normal, as some people are calling it. Uh, but is a permanent change to the fabric of society. Sure, we will go back to traveling, and sure, we will go back to, go, you know, going. hopefully the kids will go to school. I can't tell you that we, <laughs> we need to send the kids back to school as soon as possible. And there will be many things that will happen that I guess the short answer is will co be coming back to normal, but there are many things that will be changed. And I do think medicine is one of them. You know, telehealth isn't just about I'm stuck at home and I need to connect to a doctor because I can't go out of the house. Telemedicine is also a way to scale medicine into the thousands and millions of people yeah. who cannot get, you know, healthcare Access or, or are not adequate. So this is not something that, yeah. And the reason why telehealth was, was created was, was to address that problem. That problem is here before, you know, COVID-19 is going to be here after COVID-19. The only thing that COVID-19 does is it accelerates people's acceptance and adoption of such a technology, right? And, and I'm, you know, I think it's wonderful that we already have some startups in this space and some of them doing quite well in the region. I think there's a lot of promise to it um, and definitely an area that, you know, everybody should keep an eye on. That being said, I just want to say, I don't think telehealth is the only part of this, this you know, uh, equation, right? I think there's a lot of stuff around people getting access to better information and just ask yourself today, how do you get information in Arabic, in the region, about COVID-19. Not many sources, right? Not many reliable sources. Of course, and and, and people are seeking, you know, knowledge and information. Um, how do you find out doctors and, and how to book doctors? And, 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 and besides telemedicine, how do I, you know, go follow up and, and get more in, in investigation? So the whole health tech industry is about to see quite a change. Diagnostics and, you know, home care and getting people to, to be able to get a lot more home care uh, and, and so on. So there's a lot about to happen and I think it's exciting from a VC perspective to look at that. Okay, um, very quickly, because uh, we wanna, we have got a couple. Sure, I talk too much. We want, no, no Paulus, so we just want to make time for <laughs> Q&A. Um, okay, who do you think the startups and the industries are that are best positioned to find the most amount of opportunities in COVID-19 and what should their kind of battle strategy be? And conversely, on the other side of that question, who are the industries that you think are going to be the most adversely affected right now? And what should those startups be doing um, kind of to weather the storm? Yeah. You know, there's a very old story, and I don't know. I mean, I, I always, when I go to, like, conferences, step and rise and so on, I look around at the average age, and I wonder if some of these stories, and I feel like an old man, but I wonder if some of these stories are really out there, if you like. You know, Nokia started as a tire company, right? Some, a lot of people don't know that. And then sort of switched and became a, a phone company. And they got so stuck on their 3G technology and GSM technology that they couldn't adapt to sort of 4G and mobile and, and the way mobile was. So they also failed. So they're one of the greatest examples of pivoting 
and shifting. And, and they're also one pivoting. of the greatest examples of getting stuck and, and, and not pivoting. And, you know, I don't know where, where Nokia is today, right? So, you know, it's an, it's an old story. Maybe it's a generational thing. And I'm sure there's ones that are more relevant for today. The best team, the, the, sorry, the best industries aren't about industries. I can, we can talk, it's obvious healthcare is going to do well or health tech is going to do well. It's obvious that delivery and businesses that do, you know, that do last mile logistics, like, you know, Insta shops and food delivery or Talabat and menus, you know, all of these guys are going to do incredibly well because they're going to get demand from people being at home and so on. But actually, the only people who will do well, in my opinion, are agile teams that are resilient, that understand their customers or understand customer needs and can build good product quick, right? Let's just be very clear about this, you know, and, and, and I think, I'm, you know, I'm, I can name some companies and, and I'm, I'm sure some, there are lots of people who have opinions about that, which companies will do better than others. You know, there's education as well that's interesting and tutoring and remote education. That's another industry that should do well and fare well because of, of what we're talking about. I was talking to actually um, somebody that, that does a little bit of, of part-time work for us and she just started a, an online yoga thing as well. So, you know, she's, she's helping us out with Global Ventures, but also doing yoga lessons online and, you know, needs to collect online payments. So we talked a little bit about that. But anyway, stories aside, there's lots of industries that will do well. It comes down to teams, entrepreneurs and, and, and their teams and their agility, those who are willing to work harder, faster, quicker, smarter than their colleagues, not try to build everything, but really try to, to answer clients' needs and then figure out how to deliver that, you know, technically fast. Yes. Um, I've just gotten a question from Philip over WhatsApp. Um, can you please give us... <laughs> no, no, he has a question. He's interrupting my interview schedule. <laughs> can you please give us three tips for founders <laughs> right now in the current environment that they should consider to be able to pivot effectively? Sorry, say that, that question again. I lost one of my earphones. Apologies. Okay. Can you please give us three tips for founders right now in the current environment that they should consider to be able to pivot effectively? One, if you're spending money on things that you shouldn't be spending on, it, cut it right now. Collect, you know, cash will become more scarce and more difficult over the, the short term period. As a founder, you should be managing your cash very carefully. Two, do you really understand your customers? Have you spoken to your customers? You've collect data from your customers? Are you looking at that data? Are you analyzing it? And I'm not talking about the data that you decided six months ago or a year ago to collect. I'm talking about today's data. What does that data look like? Have you spoken to your clients and understand their needs? Have you reached out to some of them, especially in these difficult times and sort of said, what would it take for you to do business with me? What else can I do for you? And figure that out. And then three, are you able to differentiate yourself from competition? You know, everybody can, you know, everybody can sell, I mean, this isn't, you know, my, the cover of my AirPods uh, Air or whatever thing that I'm using right now. Everybody can sell one of these. It takes a genius to figure out how to sell a million of these and how to sell them and deliver them and so on, right? So the question is, in, don't, don't come to, you know, to investors and say, oh, look, I sold a few products of X, therefore I have a great business, I can grow. No, tell me how you can scale this up how you can make this happen time and time again, because your unit economics are the best because you figured out that the best place to sell these are, you know, Heliopolis or Mohandesin or, 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 or you figured out a consumer segment, millennials who really want this and, and so on. Whatever it is that your idea, it better be differentiated so that it can sustain the test of time. Okay, and then my last question before we go to Q&A, because I can see that we've already got eight questions in Q&A. Um, what is your, Bessel, mm -hmm. your overall um, economic outlook on the, start, the Egyptian startup space right now? So you're welcome to do a year, two years, five years. No, no, listen, the five-year outlook is easy to answer. I think it's very positive and I think it's, it's looking good. Okay. Um, you know, the economy is stabilizing, the, the oil and gas fines, the the sort of the things that have been put, the central bank reforms, when it comes to business regulation, uh, financial, have all been in a positive direction, getting people back to work, some of the me mega projects, all of that and the five-year perspective looks good. The next one to two years, I don't know. I really don't. It's just yeah. too uncertain to answer in a, care, in a, in a way. And I, you know, 
anybody who gives you an answer is actually, in my opinion, a fool right now to give you that answer because it's there's just so much happening on a global scale. You're talking about unprecedented, you know, drop in equity markets globally. You're talking about countries being shut down. What do you mean? I mean, Emirates Airlines here in Dubai is shut down. Um, and they said they're going to shut down to the end of June, but they'll review it every two weeks. So what does that mean? What does that mean for businesses? Which businesses are impacted because of that? Multiply that out to everywhere in the world and then look at it from the Egyptian perspective, you realize the short term looks very uncertain. Yes. I think I go back to what I say, you know, for those with, who are bold, definitely, you know, pursue your ideas, but conserve your cash, show scalability, get your, you know, get your team, your shareholders and your clients all lined up so that you can, you know, you can scale well. Let me stop here because I don't know if we have that much time left. We have, yeah, and we, we now have 15 questions. So I'll just ask you the questions, but I'll read them out to you, okay? Okay, and I'll keep my answer short. Okay, yes, please. So you mentioned the transportation sector, especially the mobile applications, as being a good opportunity for investment in Egypt. What are the other opportunities? This is from Mohammed Taibeh. I don't know. I, there's just so many to think about and, and, and so on. I think, listen, we've always been excited about B2B software and enterprise software. And we've been excited about it because lots of companies are, are, are bloated, if you like, with people doing manual processes that mm -hmm. are prone to errors and mistakes. I think there's a lot of room for software re-engineering, process re-engineering inside corporations. And Egypt is a perfect country with very large private and government sectors that could use with some automation. I realize that the consequence over time is maybe people lose jobs because software comes in and does their jobs for them, but that's how an economy moves forward. And I think startups that can address that will be successful in the long term. Okay, from an anonymous attendee, what is your outlook on the agri-tech sector in Egypt right now? So I haven't much, spent much time. I think it's one of those things that we've always said we'd look, down, look at it as global ventures later in the future. I read a lot about agri-tech and, and, and I'm interested in on a personal level, but not from an investment level. I think it has huge potential. I think, you know, again, it seems to me like there's some basics there that still need to be addressed in the region across emerging markets. And then when you talk about sustainability and sustainable food, one of the definite impacts of Corona or the COVID-19 is countries are going to look to themselves and to neighboring countries for self-sufficiency. Yeah. A global supply chain where everything is moving around all the time may be efficient on a cost, but it's highly disruptive in a crisis time. Okay. From Yahya Badawi, what startup would you start in Egypt today? What startup would I start in Egypt today? I guess uh, home delivery shisha this week would be pretty good, I think, now that they've shut down shishas in Egypt. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot, you know, it's funny, Egypt is the, the mother of home delivery, right? We always say that, and everybody's always proud that McDonald's was the first time to deliver in Egypt and of all places in the globe. And we have these little funny stories as Egyptians we like to tell, but that the bottom line is there's a lot more to be done, right? How 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 people, um, how goods last mile logistics and how goods get to people, I still think there's a lot of potential to that. Um, you know, this requires actually for us to have a shisha together. So tell Yahya, I'm happy to you know, take him up on that and we can talk about it. Okay, from Sara Kabil, what would you advise startups in the educational industry right now? What would I advise startups in the educational? So Egypt's always had a good, healthy cadre of, or group of, of educational startups. I think it's interesting to see how some of them will cope with this idea of distance learning and remote learning. Um, but I don't think that tech is differentiated, right? I, I mean, people may talk all about, oh, my platform can do video and it can do this and scheduling. All of that can be built. What really makes a difference in education is the content and the quality of the content and the quality of access to the people who provide the content. So if it's teachers and professors, you need to look at that. So a lot of times I see educational startups and they're very excited about what they can do with the, con with the tech. I'm always thinking, and, and why will the audience keep coming back to you? Yeah. Okay, from an anonymous attendee. As a VC, are you still doing new investments over the next quarter or are you halted until a later date until after COVID ends? 
We'll be announcing one at the end of this week. We have another one lined up for next week. On Magnet? Week. Are you announcing it on Magnet? <laughs> I know Philip's going to kill me, right? <laughs> yes, we are announcing it on Magnet. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and through all our usual channels, but Magnet will be the number one, I promise. <laughs> but yes, we have, we have deals coming down the line, and we're definitely working on, on, on new deals. I will say we're being more cautious. We're reviewing things a couple more times. You know, we've been a bit more careful looking at companies' runways. It's been an incredibly busy time looking at our portfolio and making sure that our portfolio remains healthy and where and if we need to help them, we help them. So I guess what I would say to you is, no, of course, we're continuing to do business. Some of the best investments, you know, when I did venture capital in late 90s, early 2000s, some of the best deals I did was during the 2000-2001 crisis. And I think the same thing will, be, will happen now. This will be one of the best times to, you know, to create value for investors because you can get good valuations, find really resilient entrepreneurs who are willing you know, to go through these things and not quit and so on. So the bottom line is, this is a good time to be investing, but albeit more cautiously. Okay, um, so here's quite a ruthless question from Tariq Rushdie, and he has said that it's ruthless. So as ruthless as it is, and considering the current crisis and the associated uncertainties, what can you say to the start struggling startups uh, to when they should wrap up and stop their journeys to avoid further damage. So when is it time to call it quits? Obviously, sorry, I mean, let's just start up. There's some fiduciary responsibilities that any startup shareholder of a company needs to think about, which is, you know, making sure that you, uh, when you're wrapping up a company, you're wrapping it up in the best way possible, right? And, 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 and deliver the goods to the customers that were promised, et cetera. And if you're going to, you know, going to default on any of these obligations, try to keep it to a minimum or at least try to do it as transparently as possible, right? So tell the client, if you order this now and I'm going to deliver it to you in, in two months time because I still have to source it, there may be a possibility that I can't. Are you okay? Right? I mean, be, 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 be cautious on this part. Okay. But that aside, I think the bottom line, it comes down to data. Look at your economics again. Is there revenue coming in? How much are you spending to get that revenue? So what is the cost of acquisition? What is the lifetime value? What is the churn? And stop, not lying, lying is not the right word, but stop believing that it somehow will get better next month. It will get better next month. If the data isn't getting better and getting better fast, don't waste the money. In fact, I've seen entrepreneurs in the past and I've worked with entrepreneurs in the past who had money in the bank, decided this isn't working, stopped the business, returned the money to shareholders, and then came back three months later and said, I have a new idea. And they were able to raise money very quickly because they showed the responsibility they have around running their business based on metrics, right? You don't have to burn the last dollar to prove that you've, you know, destroyed every piece of value that you could possibly do and, and that somehow it scars on your neck. Look at the data, make the decisions based on that. Obviously, if you lose big clients, it's time to think about how are you going to, you know, rebalance your costs. So there's lots of things you should be doing all the time. But ultimately, the data is what matters. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question from Faisal Kowar. How do we address the talent gap, especially on the technical side? It's everybody's problem, right? And this is a global problem. It's funny. I met a couple of entrepreneurs in Dubai the other day, about a month, a month and a half ago. Actually, right after the Magnet event in January with Tamimi. But anyway, I, I, met, I met a couple of them. They came from Denmark. And the reason why they came from Denmark to Dubai is they think that talent here is more abundant than Denmark, on the technical side especially. And it sort of, it, it made me, you know, for a second they go, hmm, really? And they said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have no idea how bad it is in Denmark. The problem is worldwide, so there isn't a simple answer. I think it comes down to this. I would rather see a startup with a few senior experienced engineers or, or team leads, well paid or paid, you know, part of the team, part of the equity structure, paid well as in paid the market rate that's really deserved for that level of experience, hiring younger junior people, training them and building that culture along to build their own team out, then I think just simply spending money on recruiting and then losing the next engineer and then having to recruit and spend money on, you know, and, and that never ends the cycle of churn. I guess the short answer is it depends on what stage. If you're an early stage, invest in learning and a learning culture. If you're a later stage, build the right environment and you know, put in the right packages and incentives to hold on to your team. 
the competition is only going to get stiffer. Yes. Um, okay. Here's another difficult question. Do you think that Egyptian startups will be downsizing their teams in the short term from another anonymous attendee? I hope so. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah, I, I, sorry. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm trying to understand the question. There's a crisis going on in the world. That crisis will have global ramifications on the global economy to the extent that it will also um, impact most, not all, most startups in a way that means business will be slower, deals will be slower, growth will be slower. If you're a leader of that startup or managing that startup, you should be adjusting your costs accordingly. You can't just blindly say, well, it's okay. I'm not, I'm, it doesn't, this doesn't affect me. I have money in the bank. I'll keep the team that I have because you know, my growth is going to come later. You need to show that you have an ability to manage up and down, up and down, because actually the line to growth is a little bit wavy, right? And as an entrepreneur, if you show that you have the skills to sort of go in these moments, Hmm, let me get rid of some of my bottom performers. Or actually this idea that I was looking at to Skindreya or to expand to Minya, maybe I'll delay that or I'll push that up or, you know, I won't do that. Now, that being said, if you've always been very, very lean and your team is highly efficient and doing really well, then you have an argument but to make, but you will be challenged on it. And therefore, I really recommend startups and entrepreneurs to take a very good look at what they're spending money on and make sure that they're investing it wisely. Um, and we are going to need the cash later. Yes, we are almost out of time. So we're, we'll just have to take one final question. Okay. Um, so I'm very sorry to all of the questions that we're unable to answer. Um, you guys can send them through afterwards. I'll make sure that Vessel sees them. Um, when do online payments become the standard? And that's a big question. I know. When online, when consumers have access to cards and have access to wallets and have access to um, that technology and and you may say but the access is already there the products are already available not really um, you know today the, 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 the penetration of credit cards is incredibly low the number of people using you know debit cards credit cards and so on in Egypt still very low um, it, it, it's it's still there's still not enough incentives in there in place so you don't get you know rewards back on those cards or cash back or, or savings or th things like that so it's still a very you know, weak digital um, um, payment system in Egypt, which is itself the opportunity, which is what makes B2C fintechs really exciting as in Egypt. But again, it comes down to how are you gonna acquire, how easy are you gonna be able to scale, and how are you gonna make that happen? And watch out, governments and banks are about to get into this in a big way. So the long and the short of it is um, the brightest, I think, I think online payments will keep growing. I think they will accelerate. I think maybe this COVID-19 could be a tipping point or be part of the start of a tipping point, but it still accesses the issue. Um, and because you mentioned government, there's a question that just came in now that I think is also very relevant from Nurdin <laughs> Khalifa. Okay. Do you think that government entities such as ITIDA should take action in facilitating startup operations amid COVID-19? So a question like that will always come with an answer of yes, of course. But the question is how will it? and in what way? I mean, it, 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 no, it, I think it comes with yes. I mean, of course, everyone, every country, Egypt especially, should have government support. And Egypt has done tremendous great work in improving the ecosystem, for sure. Can it do more? Yes. Can we criticize a billion things about it? I'm sure we can. But that doesn't matter. Every government entity should be helping support the ecosystem to help grow it. It is, the, in my opinion, my humble opinion, the only remaining hope for building sustainable economies in the long term in the region. That's my opinion. But then, then that's why I do, you know, tech investing. But that being said, um, I, I guess the short answer is how. What I'd love to see is, you know, again, you know, facilitation and access to credit to startups, that would be really helpful. Banking, banking solutions, that would be helpful. Um, you know, licensing and regulation being streamlined, still too slow, you know, et cetera. Ability to hire and import talent from other countries, that would be helpful as well. There's a whole bunch of things, but, you know, that's a longer debate and maybe, you know, a webinar on its own, frankly. Okay. Vessel, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, 
and everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so Bessel and I were also discussing some of the details from the Egypt report, which we just published, which I'll be sending over to you guys by email. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'll be in touch soon. So you can just shoot me an email. And if you have anything you'd like to ask Bessel, I can also make sure that I get that message across. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. Bye. Bye. Bye.